and welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani in Lagos. So the UK's Environment Secretary says he's urgently investigating a seizure of a British trawler and the fine of another amid an escalating row over post-Brexit fishing rights. France's Maritime Minister Annick Girardin said the ships were cautioned during checks off Le Havre overnight. France sees the British trawler for fighting in its territorial waters without a license. Furious that Britain has refused to grant its fishermen the full number of licenses to operate inside British waters that France says is warranted. Paris announced retaliatory measures if there was no progress in talks. A group representing English fishermen identified the sea's vessel as a Cornelius Geert Jan a scallop dredger and suggested it had the right to fish in French waters and may have missed off an approved list by mistake. The French government said it would, from November the 2nd, impose extra custom checks on British goods entering France, raising the prospect of more economic pain before Christmas for Britain, which faces labor shortages and rising energy prices. Is this in response to the fishing? Trawler? Britain's Interior so Minister Priti Patel describes um, France's seizure of the trawler as disappointing and that London had fulfilled all of its obligations under the trade deal. I think it's important to say, obviously, that it's disappointing and we as a country have fulfilled all our obligations under the TCA. But at the same time, government and, you know, cross-government, discussions will continue, both at commission level but also with counterparts within the French administration. Mr Speaker, next week the UK will host COP26. Britain's Environment said, Minister told Parliament that it was very French disappointing to see France threats. Commission. As I've said repeatedly, to the French, to the European Commission, our door remains ever open. And in that context, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, it is very disappointing to see the comments uh, that came from France yesterday. We believe these are disappointing and disproportionate and not what we'd expect from a close ally and partner. The measures being threatened do not appear to be compatible with the trade and cooperation agreement or wider international law, and if carried through, will be met with an appropriate and calibrated response. France Europe Minister Clay Malbone says France will adopt a zero tolerance attitude towards Britain and block access to virtually all its boats until it awards the fishing licenses France says its fishermen need in its post Brexit dispute. Speaking during a television interview, he declared his support for the threat and dialogue afterwards, since it allowed French fishermen to have a bit of over half of the fishing licenses today. He, however, said it was not enough and was not acceptable. France is considering a second round of sanctions and does not exclude a review of its export of electricity to Britain. And the viewer is Henry Ridgewell is in London for us. Henry, thanks for joining us on the program. I think it's safe to say now the realities of Brexit are beginning to hit hard on Britain as fishing rights were privileges enjoyed pre-Brexit. Could you paint us a picture of the current realities regarding this? Yeah, so before Brexit, uh, all EU countries could fish in each other's waters. So you would have British boats fishing in French waters, French boats fishing in British waters. Uh, since the Brexit agreement came into effect at the beginning of 2021, there have been restrictions on that. Uh, EU boats have been restricted in how much they can come into British waters. Uh, the British boats will get a bigger share of the uh, quotas of fish in their own waters. It's a graduated process across five years. Uh, and after 2026, there will be annual negotiations with France and presumably with other coastal nations in Europe, like the Netherlands, Belgium and Spain and so on, uh, about access to fishing waters and about access to fish quotas. Uh, and that will form the basis of the future relationship. But I think, as you uh, alluded to there, Britain is becoming uh, to understand that it's now being treated as a third country by the European Union. It's not a special case anymore. It's being treated just as Nigeria is treated by the uh, European Union, just as Australia is. So it is subject to all those uh, checks, all the sanitary checks, all the customs checks, uh, that will be carried out on imports into the European Union. Now, this crisis has escalated really because uh, Britain had 
refused to grant so many licenses to French boats to fish around the Channel Islands. Now, there are, those are islands which are just off the north coast of France, uh, which are, belong to Britain, uh, so therefore they control the fishing rights. Uh, it's been uh, tit for tat over the last few months. French boats have staged protest outside the Channel Island harbours, uh, and uh, the French have decided at this stage to take harder action. So uh, they have detained this one boat, which they say did not have a licence to fish in French waters. They have also threatened to impose full sanitary uh, and customs checks on all British imports into France. Now, you imagine the amount of trade that goes across the English Channel every day in lorries, whether it be fish, shellfish or any other goods for that matter. Imagine each and every one of those consignments is checked and you can imagine the tailbacks that will start to take place, especially in the run up to Christmas. So this is no empty threat from France. This could have a real impact on trade and on, on uh, uh, goods and supplies in the coming months. Um, and let's talk about this extra custom checks on British goods and the impact that this would have, you know, on the on Britain's economy as the holiday season approaches. But an almost similar thing did happen some months ago, didn't it? Uh, with the build up, the 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 tailbacks at the borders with France again. Uh, could that be a scenario that could be repeated? Yes, it could easily be, and that's a, a, a threat. Um, uh, something in France's arsenal that it seems to be prepared to use. So you can imagine the customs checks at the border at Calais or Boulogne is like a tap. The French can turn it, can open the tap and let the traffic flow freely and do far fewer checks, or it can really turn that tap off and, and check every single lorry uh, as it goes by. The problems we saw earlier in the year were uh, to do with that, the end of that transition period and the beginning of the, the post-Brexit reality, uh, when exporters from Britain to the EU needed to have a lot of paperwork in place to get their goods across the border. For example, almost 100% of British shellfish, things like crabs, mussels and lobsters, uh, are maybe caught in British waters, but they're actually sent to France, to Europe. There's not a huge market for them domestically back home. Uh, and so each and every one of those uh, uh, trays of, of, of shellfish uh, was checked and required a separate uh, export sanitary license. Uh, and so we could easily see these sorts of queues, these sorts of problems build up again. Uh, the trade volumes tend to increase hugely, of course, towards Christmas. We know that there are already problems globally with supply chains and with the number of truck drivers. So add on to that uh, the scenario of, of uh, very big traffic queues at the ports, and it could end up being a, a very bleak picture in the run-up to Christmas. Yeah, nobody wants that, especially you know with the holiday season, um, lots of festivities going on, uh, cooking and merrymaking. Has the British government, though, made any moves to rectify the current situation with France? Apart from Priti Patel and the other minister, the environment minister, both expressing their disappointment uh, at France. There have been talks taking place this week. Uh, yesterday, uh, British, French and European Union officials met to discuss the situation and it did end with more licenses being granted to French boats to be able to fish in Channel Island and, and British waters. So that may help to ease the situation. Uh, but the British are still insisting on their condition that the French boats show several years' worth of proof that they have been fishing in British waters in the past to enable them to continue to do so. And the small boat owners say, well, they just don't have the kind of GPS technology that would be able to provide uh, that kind of history. So it does look as though this situation may continue to escalate for now. We don't know what's going to happen to this boat that has been uh, uh, effectively uh, commandeered by the French and forced into harbour in Le Havre. But bear in mind as well the political situation. It, it strikes well for Boris Johnson and his government at the moment to uh, increase tensions in a way with Europe, especially in the post-Brexit world, of which course, of course Boris Johnson was the key proponent and supporter. But it also works well for France and the French president as well, Emmanuel Macron, who is facing re-election uh, next year in April and is under pressure to show to his constituents and to his fishing communities that he is prepared to stand up for them. And there is some political capital to be gained in, in standing up 
to the British in France. So don't expect this row to go away anytime soon. I think this has many more weeks to play and potentially uh, some difficult situations at the borders. Yeah, and I think this probably goes even much, uh, much further, um, especially with the Ocas deal, a France upset of the UK and the US. There's so much going on here. Henry, thanks again for speaking to us. Thanks, Amarachi. The US lawmakers in the House Oversight and Reform Subcommittee on the Environment are today hearing from major oil companies uh, why what they have been doing to curb climate change. The oil companies are accused of obscuring their own scientific research and revealing how their products were causing climate change. As the committee says, the industry knew about the effects of global warming since 1977, but for decades spread denial and doubt about the harm of their products. Testifying today in the hearing are CEOs of Exxon, Chevron, and BP America, the president of Shell, and the heads of lobby firms, the American Petroleum Institute and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The companies say they want to use the hearing to highlight their recent efforts to combat climate change. Meanwhile, U.S. climate envoy John Kerry says the world is not yet fully aligned with what science says needs to be done to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. He was addressing a gathering at the London School of Economics. His speech comes ahead of COP26, which starts next week. The UN's climate summit seen as vital to tackling the threat of rising temperatures. The critical question is all the world fully aligned with what science says we must do to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis? In two words, not yet. But more countries than ever before are stepping up. The real cost that no one is willing to pay is the cost of inaction. The IPCC report of 2018, the IEA report of this summer, the Financial Stability Board assessment of risk, and the marketplace opportunities for profit are all coming together to drive change and to drive a different approach. But let's be clear, despite all the momentum that is heading into Glasgow, we still face a gap. The world must work together to close this gap. But particular responsibility lies with the top 20 economies of the world, all of whom are responsible for 80% of all the emissions. A white paper released by China's State Council Information Office says the country is undergoing historic changes in coping with climate change, reversing the trend of rapid growth in its carbon dioxide emissions. The white paper says that while China's e economic and social development has been developing healthily, the carbon emission intensity has dropped significantly. The country's carbon emission intensity in 2020 was 18.8% less than that in 2015, 48.4% less than in 2005, which means about 5.8 billion tons of carbon dioxide less, thus basically refer reversing the trend of fast growth. The white paper responding to climate change, China's policies and actions says that China has made marked achievements in the energy production and consumption revolution. The proportion of non-fossil energy in the energy consumption was raised to 15.9%, 8.5% points more in 2005. The total capacity of non-fossil energy power generation accounted for 44.7% of the total. The installed capacity of photovoltaic power increased by a factor of more than 3,000 and wind power by a factor of more than 200 from that of 2005. Let's check in on developments in Sudan, where the anti-military process is still going on. It's day four since the coup that toppled the civilian government and day four since the protests began. Demonstrations are, however, reported to be smaller because of heavy security presence. Many businesses are said to be closed, as are banks and roads. Activists across the country are planning to hold a bigger demonstration on Saturday as hundreds of people continue to join in. The UN Special Representative to Sudan has met the military leader, General Abdel Fattah al buran and urged him to release detainees and restore a transitional authority, which includes civilians. The country's internet services have been down since the protests started. 
General Alburn said today it will be restored in phases if the new authority feels the media is telling the truth. Internet Freedom Monitor NetBlocks said on Wednesday the outage persists. Ousted Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok is back at his residence and has been visited by ambassadors from the UK, the EU, Germany, France and the United Nations. Now to Ethiopia, where the latest airstrikes on Tigrayan region's capital, Mekele, has left six people killed, including three children and 27 others wounded. Federal forces have been conducting aerial bombardments on the city for more than a week as part of its year-long war with Tigrayan rebels. The coordinator of emergency services at Mekele's Ida Hospital, Nurse Abebe Haftu, said the consequences of the airstrikes by the Ethiopian military were cataclysmic with bodies chopped into pieces. Earlier today, intense fighting was reported to be continuing around the cities of Desi and Kombolcha in Amhara State between Tigrayan rebels and the Ethiopian army with its allies. Russians eager to begin the one week of work as recommended by the government to, to curb the spread of coronavirus pandemic have shut shops, restaurants and schools. Only essential shops like supermarkets and pharmacies are being allowed to open in Moscow, while food outlets are only providing takeaways. There's more in the global update. The new lockdown in Russia would also affect transportation. Moscow residents today use the city metro as usual before they will be forced to remain indoors. The Russian capital brought in its strictest lockdown measures since June 2020 as hospitals confront a rising wave of cases that has sent one-day pandemic deaths to record highs. The partial lockdown, in which only essential shops like pharmacies and supermarkets are allowed to remain open, while schools and state kindergartens are shut, comes ahead of a nationwide week-long workplace shutdown from October 30. Ukraine's police released a video showing a doctor seated at his desk while a masked officer counts bundles of cash found stashed in the office, $12,000 worth in total. The televised raid this week on a doctor's surgery in the region is one of hundreds of criminal investigations publicized by the authorities in a clampdown on a flourishing black market in forged vaccine and COVID-19 tested documents. After a lull in the summer, Ukraine is experiencing some of the highest death rates from COVID-19 in the world. The Chinese mainland on Wednesday reported 23 new locally transmitted cases. Of the new local cases, eight were in Gansu, seven in Inner Mongolia, three in Beijing, two in Ningxia, one each in Heilongjiang, Shandong and Sichuan, one each in Beijing and Sichuan were confirmed to be reconfirmed to be active cases from asymptomatic cases. Finally, Moderna Incorporated's vaccine will start to be used in children and teens in the United States within weeks, according to its chief executive, ahead of a health conference which begins virtually from November 15th to the 18th. Moderna CEO Stefan Bensel says, based on dialogue with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, he believes his company's vaccine will be authorized for 12 to 17-year-olds in the next few weeks. Moderna applied for U.S. authorization of its shot for those aged 12 to 17 in June. It published positive data from a clinical trial in children ages 6 to 11 this week, but has not yet submitted an application to regulators for that age group. Eight agencies have been distributing foodstuff, blankets and cash to 130 displaced families in Kabul amid rising poverty and warnings of starvation in the country. Around 9 million Afghans are just one step away from starvation, according to the UNHCR, saying that 700,000 people, many of them women and children, have been displaced this year alone. United Nations officials say the UN cannot get enough cash into Afghanistan to deliver humanitarian aid and is struggling to develop options to help stabilize the collapsing economy. The Taliban is facing growing international pressure for an inclusive and representative Afghan government and to uphold human rights, particularly those of women and girls, in return for international recognition and freeing up aid and reserves.
60% of them are women and children. Around 9 million Afghans are just one step away from starvation. It's a story of hunger, of conflict, of poverty. And now winter is coming as well. Afghans need help desperately and quickly. Uh, we are trying to bring as much uh, uh, supplies from all around the world. At times, uh, we see many border disruptions all, all around uh, in Afghanistan, neighboring countries as well. We need to fly in aid into Afghanistan as well. So these are all challenges that we have to navigate as humanitarian. So the appeal to everyone, international community, please step forward with resources so that we can reach uh, more uh, Afghans who need our help. Well, that was the UNHCR spokesperson, Baba Balok. And as we end the program, fashion designers are becoming more creative, as we see, using just about anything to make clothes these days, even though most of it is just for show. And we've seen toilet paper dresses, paper dresses, plastic, plastic dresses. So how about dresses made from chocolate? And that's what happened at the 26th edition of the Paris Chocolate Exhibition which was inaugurated on Wednesday evening. And for the first time, the Salon du Chocolat trade show was held since the pandemic hit and bore the theme of Renaissance. So check out the designs of these creators who just want to make the world a little sweeter. And those are some really sweet designs. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi.